Assalamualaikum and greetings repeat to Dr. Kairil. So we are from the group of Tengku Maimun CJ and we will be presenting on checks and balances by the legislature in Malaysia. So the presentation today will go as follows. Firstly, I, Najia, will be introducing the question. Secondly, Sister Shahira will be explaining checks and balances on the side of legislature towards the executive. Thirdly, Sister Noha will be explaining checks and balances on the side of legislature towards the judiciary. And lastly, I will conclude the discussion for today. Our question reads, the doctrine of separation of powers in the federal constitution requires the legislature to check the executive and the judiciary. Explain how the legislature checks and balances the power of the executive and the judiciary in Malaysia by referring to decided cases and relevant provisions of the constitution and laws. So next, let's start with the important concepts to tackle the question. So first and foremost, it is important to understand that Malaysia has a unique form of government in which it practices parliamentary democracy and also constitutional monarchy. So Malaysia follows the Westminster model, where there is a PM, the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister acts as the head of the government and he will pick his own cabinet that will exercise the executive function of the government. So the Prime Minister is directly answerable to the legislature. In our system, the head of state is a monarch bound by the constitution, which is in line with the constitutional monarchy system. So next concept is the doctrine of separation of power, in which this doctrine aims to fully separate the organs of government into three. Firstly, the legislature, the legislative body, which is uh, the one that is responsible to make laws. Secondly, the executive body, which is the one that governs and enforces the law. And lastly, the judiciary body, which is the one that applies the law that was made by the legislative. So this principle includes separation of institutions and separation of functions between the institutions. So in simpler words, there should be no dual membership of the members of the mentioned organs. For example, a member of the executive, by right, should not also be the member of judiciary and carry out judicial power. So he has to stick to the organ that he belongs to. From this doctrine, the principle of check and balance can be derived in which every organ is given specific powers over the other branches to oversee their conduct. So in Malaysia, the legislative body is the parliament which consists of the YDPA, Yang Dipertua Agong, Dewan Negara and Dewan Rakyat. This is as in Article 44 of the Federal Constitution. The executive authority on the other hand is given to the Yang Dipertua Agong, exercisable by him or by the cabinet or any minister the, cab the cabinet authorizes or other persons the parliament may delegate its power to. This is as in Article 39 of the Federal Constitution. Article 121, on the other hand, establishes the Superior Courts, High Courts, Court of Appeal, and Federal Court to carry out the judicial functions. So, the last important concept is the concept of rule of law. So, in this concept, no one is above the law, not even the government. Thus, the country, Malaysia, adopts the principle of check and balance, which complements the doctrine of separation of power to ensure that all these organs are free from unfairness. So, all organs would, in turn, be conscious of the actions as they are aware that the other organs are looking over them as well. So this, is, uh, this will ensure that we can upheld the rule of law because all these organs will, uh, will work hand in hand to ensure that they are doing their functions with responsibility and with integrity. So next, I pass the floor to Sister Shahira to further discuss the question. Thank you very much, Sister Nadia. My name is Nushaira Balkis and I would like to continue on the next part of this presentation. So we will be talking about the legislature, checks and balance towards the executive. So firstly, the separation of power in Malaysia is vested in the three main organs of the government, namely the legislative, the executive, as well as the judiciary, and all of them derive their powers from the constitution. The legislative body consists of three components, including the YDPA, Dewan Negara, and Dewan Rakyat. The main functions of the legislative is to pass federal laws, make amendments to existing federal laws, examine the government's policies, approve the government's expenditures, approve the new taxes, and many more. On the other hand, the executive governs the country according to the laws made by the parliament. And in addition to that, the functions, jurisdictions, other than those provided for the legislative, and judiciary shall be deemed to be under the power of executive functions. In the federal government, the executive consists of the conference of rulers, YDPA, the prime minister, the cabinet, as well as public services. Although the judge in the case of public prosecutor and Kok Wah Kwan ruled that the doctrine of separations of powers in Malaysia is not expressly mentioned or is not a mere provision in the Malaysian constitution, these doctrines remains as the spirit and soul of the constitution in order to safeguard the organs of government from any abuse of power and centralization of authority. If the legislative branch or the parliament does not satisfy with the prime minister or the executive, members of the legislative can cast a vote of no confidence 
against him. A motion of no confidence is basically a vote that indicate a person is no longer deemed fit and has the majority support to hold the position. And these operations enables that the executive to become subservient to the legislative branch and thus avoid any abuse of power and ensure transparency because every act done by the executive must be in accordance with the legislation. So this is further enshrined in Article 43 Clause 4 of the Federal Constitution which mentioned if the Prime Minister ceases to command the confidence of the majority of the members of House of Representatives. Then, unless at his request of YDPA dissolve parliament, the Prime Minister shall attend the resignation of the cabinet. By virtue of this provision, Prime Minister can be dismissed and removed if he ceases to command the confidence by way of resignation or YDPA resolve the parliament. And this principle is also applicable at the state level, which further mentioned in section 2 clause 6 of the 8th schedule. Due to this doctrine, if a vote of no confidence is passed in the parliament, the prime minister is deemed to lose the support of the majority of the members and the government must responsible collectively, meaning to say the entire government must resign. However, what amounts to loss of confidence of the majority of the members of the house is nowhere defined. Hence, uh, so long the majority if the half plus one of the total membership of the house no longer has confidence in the executive, they shall no longer be in power. This practice can be further illustrated in the judgment of Abdul Qadir Sulaiman in the case of Tun Datu Haji Mustafa bin Datu Harun and Tun Datu Haji Muhammad Adnan Robert yang di Pertua Negeri Sabah and Datuk Joseph Pairing Kitigan. In this case, Datuk Joseph Pairing Kitigan was appointed as the head of government but subsequently began to collapse in the way of some defections of his, of his assemblyman to the rival coalition. However, the state cabinet minister refused to follow the resignation of the chief minister. In this case, the court followed the judgment of Adik Benra and Akintola in which the privy council held that there is no limitation as to the material by which lack of confidence should be assessed. What matter most is that if one who is in the position lost the confidence from his government, he must ought not to remain in his office. To further emphasize this principle, we could also observe from the federal court decision in the case of Datu Sri Insinia Haji Nizar Jamaluddin and Datu Sri Dr. Zamri Abdul Qadir Nizar Jamaluddin, where in this case, the appellant sought the declaration that he was still the Menteri Besar of Perak when actually uh, the, His Royal Highness Sultan of Perak received three letters from the members claiming that they had lost confidence in the appellant. And the court held that the evidence from outside of the house, like statutory declarations from the MPs, can also be taken into consideration by His Majesty in determining whether there is loss of confidence. However, the most prominent factors is that the number must come from the majority. And it is safe to say that in the current practice of our legislation, uh, if the legislative lost the confidence towards the executive, then they can table a motion of no confidence in the parliament. In short, the collective responsibility and the power given to cast a vote of no confidence is vital in upholding the principle of parliamentary democracy as has been practiced by our country. Although we cannot observe a clear and total distinction of separation of powers among the legislative and the executive because there are tendency to be overlapping between uh, the person who are in the legislative and executive and our practice is unlike other countries like United States of America, the current practice in Malaysia, however, disable any centralization of power on behalf of the executive, especially the prime minister. And interestingly, the word of confidence on the other hand allows the prime minister to prove his moral legitimacy which will impliedly help the executive pertaining to the administration and the governance of the country like what has been passed in parliament recently and while vice versa if it is proven that the prime minister no longer holds the trust from his own cabinets then the position must be replaced to ensure political stability.
Moving on to the part where the legislature checks and balances the power of the judiciary, for mostly it is material to note that Malaysia is a democratic country where the people's interest is the paramount consideration in arriving at such a verdict. Prior to the deliberation on the check and balance between legislature and judiciary, it shall be acknowledged and on the establishment of the Malaysian judicial system as per the antecedent of the United Kingdom judicial system, by which it is an unified judicial system founded on the British common law. Moving on, the power of the judiciary the power for the judiciary is as stipulated in the Federal Constitution, namely in Article 1 to 1, allocating the jurisdiction of the courts throughout the entire judicial system. On the basis of this doctrine, the endeavor to safeguard liberty and vault abuse of power by tract and balance basically on three organs. And the action of legislative check and balance in the judiciary can be seen in a few circumstances. And to add an amendment of the constitution specifically in regards to the judicial power, as well as appointment and removal of judges. To commence, the permanent event to connote the check and balance by the legislature to, to the judiciary is in 1988, namely the amendment of Article 121 plus 1 and the occurrence of judicial crisis. Initially, notwithstanding the doctrine of separation of power, the amendment has effectively denied the independence and laid down the limitation of interference made by the judiciary. The original provision stipulated that the power and judicial matters was specially and exclusively vested to the judiciary, respectively, judicial power and the federation shall be vested in two high courts. On the contrary to the amount of version, whereby there shall be two high courts of coordinate jurisdiction and status that there shall have jurisdiction and powers, which may be conferred by all under federal law. Based on the above, it is crystal clear that the deletion of the word vested has undermined the word of judiciary, as well as denoting the court institution is vulnerable to be interfered with by, or, by other organs, either by the government or non government bodies. The lacuna in the law has padded their power to agree which urges the people to impugn the definite power of the judiciary. As a matter of fact, the amendment was made in subsequent to the case of PP and Dr. Yapang, thereby discoursing on the contravention of power allocated in section 418A of the Criminal Proceeding Code to Article 1 to 1 plus 1, by which it states that notwithstanding section 417 and subject to section 418B, the public prosecutor may in any particular case tribal by a criminal court subordinate to the High Court issue a certificate specifying the High Court in which the proceedings are to be instituted or transferred and requiring, requiring that the accused person be caused to appear or be produced before such High Court. The power of the public prosecutor under subsection 1 shall be exercised by him personal. The prosecution in the same case has initiated to transfer the case to other court and pursuant to the section mentioned above, thereby it grants the power to the prosecution counsel to discharge a judicial power. Similarly, in the case of Pandawa Raya and Datu Sri Manaji bin Haji Abdul Raza, the court had acknowledged the unconstitutionality of section 418A of the criminal prosecution code. Albeit, as we are depending on the doctrine of stare decisis, including the majority judgment as per Abdul Hamid, including the majority judgment as per Abdul Hamid Muhammad, the case of BP and Cobalt One concluded that despite the amendment, the judiciary power remained and sustained. To elaborate, the case arises when the Court of Appeal held that the sentence for a section 97, subsection 2 of the Child Act 2001 is conferred by the YDPA for the convicted child charge on section 302 of the Penal Code. The gist of section mentioned before is deemed to be contrary to the doctrine of separation of power on the basis of confiding power vested by the court to the legislature. In addition, in the case of Samini Jaya, where in this case it involves the non-government body, where the court held that any discharge of judicial power made by anyone who is not a judge, nor a judicial judicial officer, nor a governmental officer is an act of alter bias to Article 1 to 1. Nonetheless, it is, is it actually possible to infer 
that the environment has eliminated the check and balance of the two organs. Roughly speaking, it is here as to say such a thing. The environment shall not be deemed to be inimical to, to the judiciary, rather a duty of the judiciary to uphold the constitution, but has eventually impinged its power as well, impugning their capacity and power on such matters. The fact that Malaysia is a developer contrary considers the people as the significant factors in implementing such things, including any amendment of the federal constitution. Furthermore, I shall continue to be reminded that the doctrine of separation has indicated the law by which the constitution as the supreme entity of the law, and for that all the three organs and any people further on this land is nothing higher than the federal constitution. Apart from the above, the constant police by legislation to the judiciary can be seen through the plenary removal of judges pursuant to Article 122. Be, and for that any appointment of the superior court judges need to be made in suit to the consultation with the Prime Minister. To support the case in the key to, to support the court in the case of Latasri and Al Ibrahim and BP held that even if the YDPA disagrees or withhold in giving his advice, the Prime Minister can legally insist the YDPA to appoint the judge. And then additionally the defective case to support this is by the sacking of Dun Sani Abbas, the former Lord President and the other three Supreme Court judges by the Prime Minister, which was Dr. Mahadi. As a matter of discussion, shall be known that the case emerges due to the challenge made by the position for the vote won by the Omni selection in conceding that the court might be in favour of the position. He then eliminates all the judges in fear of losing the truth. Hither though, hitherto, the case is reckoned to be consequential one to the judiciary to not interfere with the legislature or else. On the other point, as we are keeping with the status quo, in the recent uh, news, it has been stated that Tun Kumai Muntuan Kumai, Tuan Mai, the incumbent chief judge of nations, voiced out her concern in upholding the judicial independence. She then elaborated that the appointment and removal of the judicial members should remain political and free from any form of from any form of interference and influence. In relation to this matter, considering the heavy duty of the judiciary and process occurring in this, in this institution shall be inextricably within it. The intercession of other organs, though done in the name of check and balance, is still deemed to be encroaching and tempering with the judiciary system. Based on the above justification, justification, it can be concluded that the only way for the legislation to check and balance the judiciary is through the process of appointment of so in short, the legislative body may exercise the principle of check and balances on the executive, firstly, by the status quo that requires the executive to be directly answerable to the legislature at the parliament. Secondly, the legislature can also table a motion of no confidence in order to force the prime minister to resign or to advise the young Dipaton Agong to dissolve the parliament. On the other hand, the legislature influences the, judi the judiciary as the young Dipaton Agong will appoint the judges on advice of the prime minister after consulting the conference of rulers. This allows the Prime Minister to pick judges that he is confident of to do their work. Secondly, the Prime Minister or the Chief Justice, after consulting with the Prime Minister, can also table a motion in the Parliament to send a request to the young Dipatuan Agong to set up a tribunal to remove a certain judge, where there will be certain procedures to be followed. So, our opinion, we believe that the doctrine of separation of power is a very important doctrine in building a country that is free of bias, fair and just. We believe that humans are not free from making mistakes and sometimes might even lose their, mor their moral compass and act dishonestly, hence the need for another to always act as an overseer to them. Even from the Islamic perspective, it is mentioned in the Quran, Surah Al-Nisa, verse 135, that people have to stand out firmly for justice, meaning that we should always fight against in injustice. So this is why we believe that check and balance is important, so that members of one organ will constantly be in fear to commit any misconduct. Thus, we have three suggestions for today. Firstly, our suggestion is for the Federation to always adopt this doctrine and keep the current practices of check and balances as of now, as we believe that it is a good way to ensure that the organs of governments are working systematically and always conscious of the thought that their work is reviewed by another. Next, we also believe that the judiciary has to be independent, and an effective way to do so is by returning the phrase vested into high courts that used to be in Article 121 of the Federal Constitution as mentioned in the above point. We also agree with Tengku Maimun Sijia's opinion that the judge's appointment should be free from the executive's interference since we believe that this will ensure that there will be no potential bias or unfairness that might arise from the appointment. So with that, thank you very much. and. Never been prouder to present.